And welcome to the Unitarian Church of Evanston. I'm Eileen Wibiat. I am the senior minister here. Whether this is your spiritual home or you are newly discovering this community, we are so grateful to share this morning and this time together. We strive to be an inclusive and welcoming community seeking truth and love and nurturing the human spirit for a world made whole. We are guided by our principles and values, which remind us in every moment and through every challenge that each of us is worthy of love and that we are all connected through the vast and beautiful web of existence. We come together to remember our kinship with one another and to hold one another in heart and mind with, careful te with tenderness and careful attention and to dedicate ourselves more fully to living our shared values. People of all ages are a welcome and important part of our faith community. We are blessed to have the children in the sanctuary for the first half of every service, and the entire service is for all ages about once a month, including today. The nest in the front is our designated area for families with young children, where we have quiet fidget toys and activities and a kid-friendly order of service. And nursery care is available in room 11 every Sunday. As part of being a welcoming and inclusive community, we have some information posted on the screen that will help orient you to UCE and our service, and a few announcements. Today, after the service, children are invited to gather in the nest if they wish to participate in an egg hunt, which will be out on the South Lawn. And everyone can join the potluck brunch, and while you're waiting in line, enjoy the Peeps show. <laughs> We also have some up here if you didn't notice. The May 3rd and 4th rummage sale is quickly approaching. Now is the time to sign up to volunteer, gather donations, and spread the word. It's a great way to make new friends and get rid of some stuff. Stop by the info table today at the back of the sanctuary or on any Sunday leading up to the sale date. An informal UCE task force is working toward a vote at the May 19th annual meeting on a congregational Israel-Gaza ceasefire hostage re release resolution, coupled with an effort to raise life-saving humanitarian aid. Please stop by the information table after the service or read more in the newsletter. And UCE will host the Chicago Area UU Council Spring Conference on Saturday, April 13th. The conference theme is Welcoming Congregation Renewal. The work of welcome is never done. Come join us to learn, support, and gather momentum in our collective welcome, welcoming work. You can go to uuchicagoarea.org for more details and registration. And now, let us settle into our shared time of reflection, celebration, and inspiration. As we begin our worship service, those joining us online are invited to gather your chalice as we join in beloved community. Welcome to worship.
The Unitarian Church of Evanston resides on land that was recorded as being transferred from the local Potawatomi community to the U.S. government in 1829 shortly before the Potawatomi in this area were forcefully removed west of the Mississippi River. This land was then sold to white settlers. We remember the ancestors of contemporary African Americans, the individuals, families, and networks of black people who built up our country's culture and economy, a role forced on them originally by enslavement. We acknowledge the intentional violence that landed on North American shores in 1619 has continued throughout the generations and remains a reality today. These acknowledgments are one small effort toward building long-term solidarity with contemporary communities. We commit ourselves to take what we learn here today and incorporate it into our lives and turn our thoughts into actions. Please join in our words of shared commitment. In these realities with honor for all of the ancestors, respect for our descendants, and gratitude for the land we use as sacred space. Kristen Lems brought the flowers in honor of what would have been the 100th birthday of her mother, Carol Lems Dworkin. As Kristen and members of her family light our chalice, the symbol of our living tradition, please join me in saying the words on the screen by trans poet Andrea Gibson. I said to the sun, tell me about the Big Bang. The sun said, it hurts to become. Hallelujah to the ache, to the pull, to the fall, to the pain. Hallelujah to the grace and the body and every cell of us all. Please rise in body or spirit and join in saying the words of our covenant. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Before we sing our opening hymn, I invite those joining us online to greet each other in chat, and those gathered in the sanctuary to turn to one another near you and briefly say good morning, trying to greet someone who is new to you. Good morning. Stay after the service and continue your conversations. And if you're new to UCE, please stop by the welcome table with the red tablecloth at the back of the sanctuary. Carolyn Laughlin is there to give you more information about our community. And now let us sing our opening hymn, number 1068, Rising Green.
worship will have a slightly different flow from our usual order of service. And this celebration of Easter will be a little different from a typical Easter Sunday. As Unitarian Universalists, uh, per our perspective on the Easter story is often different from our Christian siblings. We're more likely to focus on the rebirth of spring than the resurrection of Jesus as the salvation of souls. And this day happens to also be Trans Day of Visibility. And we are focusing on transformation as we have been all month. Today we celebrate the transfer, transforming power of love revealed through struggle and pain, which can help us to become more real more authentically ourselves. Our values teach that though we all contain light and shadow, goodness, as well as the potential to do great harm, we are nonetheless born whole with inherent worth and dignity. And yet our expectations of ourselves and one another often get in the way of us knowing and recognizing our wholeness and our oneness. It is love that makes us real. Love that liberates, empowers, and emboldens us to be our full selves and allows our truest and most authentic selves to emerge into the world. This is the story we are telling today. And so we begin with excerpts from The Velveteen Rabbit, as told by Marjorie Williams. There was once a velveteen rabbit, and in the beginning he was really splendid. He was fat and bunchy as a rabbit should be. His coat was spotted brown and white. He had real thread whiskers, and his ears were lined with pink sateen. On Christ Christmas morning, when he sat wedged in the top of the boy's stocking with a sprig of holly between his paws, the effect was charming. For a long time, he lived in a toy cupboard or on the nursery floor, and no one thought very much about him. He was naturally shy, and being only made of velveteen, some of the more expensive toys quite snubbed him. The mechanical toys were very superior and looked down upon everyone else. They were full of modern ideas and pretended they were real. The rabbit could not claim to be a model of anything, for he didn't know that real rabbits existed. He thought they were all stuffed with sawdust like himself. The poor little rabbit was made to feel himself very insignificant and commonplace, and the only person who was kind to him at all was the skin horse. The skin horse lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed the seams underneath. <coughs> he was wise, for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive and boast and swagger, and he knew that they would never turn into anything else. What is real? asked the rabbit one day when they were lying side by side. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? Asked the rabbit. <laughs> Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily, or have sharp edges, or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been lugged off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. <clears throat> once you are real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always.
I invite us now to settle into our time of sharing the joys and sorrows that are held by this community. If you have a joy or a sorrow you would like to be spoken aloud, you can write it in this book, which is found at the table just as you enter the sanctuary. You can send me or Reverend Susan an email, or you can fill out the Google online form found on the homepage of our website. We listen to these offerings with tenderness and respect, so we try to settle our bodies and our minds and our voices for this moment by breathing in together and breathing out. These are the joys and sorrows that have been shared today. Sarah Devaney writes that on Friday, my parents and I celebrated one year of being in Evanston, and on Monday, we'll be one year living in our house. Congratulations, so good to have you. Marjorie Rogasner uh, invites us to say goodbye to Daniel for now. Daniel in the lobby, is this is his last regular Sunday. He's still going to be with us on a more uh, temporary basis or an as-needed basis. So just wish him uh, well and thank you for his smile and, and welcoming words on Sunday mornings. Good luck to you, Dan. And from Kristen Lems and the family of Carol Lems Dworkin, our beloved mother, grandmother, and now great-grandmother has brought flowers today in celebration of her 100th birthday on, yes, April Fool's Day. She always said it had, uh, she had the best birthday because no one would ever forget it. <laughs> And on her 80th birthday, she bought 80 flowers and asked each guest to take one. So today we have bought at least 100 flowers and asked each person to take one after the service. A little um, prelude to our uh, flower communion that happens in June. So please take a flower after the service in celebration of her life with us. Sharing these concerns of the heart is part of the practice of building beloved community. And we know that there are many other joys and sorrows that are in our hearts in this moment and in the world beyond these walls. And so we are invited to come forward and light a candle for something that's on your heart this morning that might be too tender to say out loud. There will be three uh, stations to light candles. And if you need a candle brought to you, please raise your hand and we will do so. Please come forward now.
For these joys, we give our thanks. For these sorrows, we give our love. Bless you. Please join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. This prayer by the Reverend M. Jade Kaiser from the website Enfleshed. Keep your proclamations of grandeur. Give me an Easter as small as a seed, one that can be planted while it's still cold outside, one that can be watered with tears and demands time and patience to grow. I don't need to know how large it will become, how long until it blossoms, or even if it will be pretty. I only want it to grow roots that dig deep down, striving for life in the underbelly of the world. Spare me the cosmic promises of otherworldly escape and point to the sacred possibilities within reach. Tell me again about how the nutrients born from decay keep even the saddest places brimming with potential for life. Our song response is number 123, Spirit of Life. As we say in our covenant each Sunday, service is our law. UCE is called by our mission, values, and principles to contribute to our community, to form accountable partnerships, and to express gratitude through giving. Today's offering is a special one. This year, there is a rare fifth, fifth Sunday. So, instead of 52 Sundays this year, we have 53, which enables us to give away 100% of what we collect today. Here to talk about where we will be giving a special offering is Mary Dudecht. As people of faith, we gather at a very troubling time. Social justice activist Grace Lee Boggs once said, these are times that grow our souls. Those words are ever more true today, particularly as we bear witness to the humanitarian crisis occurring in Gaza after the attacks in Israel tragedy upon tragedy. There have been presentations in the Evanston community bringing us firsthand knowledge and eyewitness accounts of the humanitarian crisis. At an event at Lake Street Church, two doctors who had been to Gaza in January spoke about their experiences. One, Dr. Zahir Salal, who is the president and co-founder of MedGlobal, shared that he had a habit of asking children, what would you like to be in the future? Mostly they want to be doctors. One child who was in a shelter for the displaced answered, what future? 
Each of us has the opportunity to support four organizations bringing food, water, medicine, and other humanitarian supplies to the war-torn people of Gaza. It starts today with our fifth Sunday shared offering and continues to Saturday, April 6. 100% of our collection today will go to these four organizations, Doctors Without Borders, Med Global, Middle East Children's Alliance, and World Central Kitchen. The World Central Kitchen has now brought almost 200 tons of food to the people of northern Gaza who are facing starvation. The cost for the Middle East Children's Alliance to provide food is 31 cents per meal. So a donation of $310 will buy 1,000 meals. There's more details available about each of these dedicated organizations and how they're providing aid to the people of Gaza. From now until Saturday, April 6, you can continue to tri contribute to this UCE collective response. 100% of the donations will go to this cause. Please put Gaza on the line for your shared offering or on your check website donation. After April 6, you can continue to donate to the four organizations directly. This relief effort is being made jointly with the principled ceasefire resolution which is proposed to be voted on at the May 19th annual meeting. This two-part effort is your chance to really make an impact in the lives of the people who need our help now. The UCE newsletter will have more information about our upcoming four town hall meetings. There are copies of the resolution on the tables in the back of the sanctuary. We want to put the names of everyone who donates on the Peace Dove poster at the back. So please tell the people at the tables if you donate today or by May 19th. Be assured that whatever you contribute will be put to very good use and will offer hope to very desperate people. In a recent sermon, Reverend Eileen reminded us that our purpose is to offer ourselves, each other, and the world an antidote, to affirm that another way is possible. These offerings are your opportunity to make that real. Thank you very much for your generosity. You may text to give, mail in a check, put cash in the collection bowls, or give from our website. If you write a check, please indicate in the memo line if your check is for the shared offering or some other giving. The ushers will now come forward to pass the collection bowls down the rows. Please give as generously as you are able, and may what you give bring you joy.
Thank you for your generosity. The rabbit longed to become real, to know what it felt like. And yet the idea of growing shabby and losing his eyes and whiskers was rather sad. He wished that he could become without these uncomfortable things happening to him. Spring came and they had long days in the garden for wherever the boy went, the rabbit went too. And once when the boy was called away suddenly to go to tea, the rabbit was left out on the lawn until long after dusk and Nana had to come and look for him because the boy couldn't go to sleep unless he was there. You must have your old bunny, she said. Fancy all that fuss for a toy. The boy sat up in bed and stretched out his hands. Give me my bunny, he said. You mustn't say that. He isn't a toy. He's real. When the little rabbit heard that, he was happy. For he knew that what the skin horse had said was true at last. The nursery magic had happened to him. and He was no longer a toy. He was real. Excerpts from the Journal of a Trans Girl by Grace Tavit, February 7th, 2011. Dear Journal, I just got my hormones tonight. After all this time, I'm finally taking my life into my own hands. The doctor was so nice. Everybody was. It was amazing. Finally, after all these years of saving and counseling, I'm one step closer to becoming a true girl. From what I can tell, they aren't the strongest thing, but at least it's a step, even if it's a tiny one. Huh. After walking back home, I felt so paranoid someone would walk up behind me and steal the pills. I kept them clutched in my hand, in my pocket, and would take them out just to admire them. Guess I sound a bit obsessive, <laughs> but in all seriousness, I am so happy to finally have the tools to do what I've always wanted to do. I can't wait until the first changes come around. Jane. i 
Then one day the boy was ill. It was a long and weary time, for the boy was too ill to play. And then the fever turned, and the boy got better, and his room needed to be disinfected, and all the books and toys that the boy had played with in bed must be gotten rid of. The little rabbit was put into a sack and carried out to the end of the garden, where he sat feeling very alone. He thought of the skin horse so wise and gentle and all that had, he had told him of what, use, of what use was it to be loved and lose one's beauty and become real if it all ended like this. And a tear, a real tear, trickled down his little shabby velvet nose and fell to the ground. And then a strange thing happened for where the tear had fallen, a flower grew out of the ground, a mysterious flower, not at all like anything that grew in the garden. It was so beautiful that the little rabbit forgot to cry, and the blossom opened, and out of it there stepped a fairy. And she came close to the little rabbit and gathered him up in her arms and kissed him on his velveteen nose that was all damp from crying. Little rabbit, she said, don't you know who I am? I am the nursery magic fairy, she said. I take care of all the playthings that the children have loved when they are old and worn out and the children don't need them anymore. Then I come and I take them away with me and turn them into real. Wasn't I real before? Asked the little rabbit. You were real to the boy, the fairy said, because he loved you. Now you shall be real to everyone. And she held the little rabbit close in her arms and flew with him into the woods. In the open glade between the tree trunks, the wild rabbits danced with their shadows on the velvet grass. I have brought you a new playfellow, the fairy said. You must be very kind to him and teach him all he needs to know in rabbit land. And she kissed the little rabbit again and put him down on the grass. Run and play, little rabbit, she said. But the little rabbit sat quite still for a moment and never moved, for when he saw all the wild rabbits dancing around him, he suddenly remembered about his hind legs and he didn't want them to see that he was made all in one piece. He did not know that when the fairy kissed him that last time she had changed him all together. And he might have sat there a long time, too shy to move, if just then something hadn't tickled his nose. And before he thought what was, he was doing, he lifted his hind toe to scratch it. And he found that he actually had hind legs. Instead of dingy velveteen, he had brown fur, soft and shiny. His ears twitched by themselves, and his whiskers were so long that they brushed the grass. He gave one leap, and the joy of using those hind legs was so great that he went springing about the turf on them, jumping sideways and whirling round as the others did. He was a real rabbit at last, at home with the other rabbits. There is a lesser known story of the Christian resurrection myth, which exemplifies the Christian faith's belief in suffering as transformative and spiritually healing. During the crucifixion, it is said that one of the wounds that Christ endured was healing to believers and even gave birth to the institution of the church itself. Following this miraculous description, the reader is assured of this truth. He who saw this has testified 
so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, so that you may also continue to believe. As a sexual and gender minority, I have suffered and been persecuted in ways that cannot be seen by others, but requires others to rely upon my testimony of truth. Today, I will briefly share some of my testimony of my body so you may believe my transgender truth without having to suffer as I have in order to know myself to be real. Survival has required decisiveness and thoroughness to find each life-saving person and resource throughout my transition thus far. In my spiritual search to answer, why are there transgender people? Why could anyone be made to suffer as I am? I have used my Unitarian Universalist religious freedom to leave no stone unturned and no egg unhatched. In Christian theology, Christ's suffering is believed to save all humans from threat of eternal suffering and is perhaps only comforting with the reassurance of Christ's enduring quality. That is, no matter the sharpness of thorns or weight of boulders that Christ endures, and through that painful endurance a miraculous change occurs, not just for Christ, but for all people. Divinity's largeness embraces and cradles the totality of human suffering, making safe what was untenable. The message of the crucifixion and resurrection could be understood as the suffering of the body merging all bodies who suffer. In that way, Christ's body becomes the body of all bodies, a singularity of human flesh united in overcoming all of our suffering. This supernatural, salvific quality of suffering is one of the central areas of focus in Christian theological religious studies. In 2022, academic influence awarded Dr. Cardida Moss, the, influential, the, the, the most influential woman in religious studies in the past 10 years award. Dr. Moss is the Edward Cadbury Professor of Theology at the University of Birmingham and research associate at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at New York University, focusing on early and medieval Christian martyrdom and theology. Dr. Moss and her co-author, Joel Badan, made public headlines in 2015 when they documented over 15,000 ancient clay items illegally seized and housed by conservative Christian craft store Hobby Lobby. Dr. Moss's verification findings eventually led to the 15,000 ancient clay items being repatriated to Iraq and Egypt. Among her works, Dr. Moss is deeply concerned with the human body as a conduit for divinity. In her analysis of manuscript illustrations from Western European Christians in the 1200s, devout depictions glorify Jesus birthing the living embodiment of the church institution through his side wound. That even the injuring of the holy body is beneficial and a source of spiritual love and comfort. Christian mystics of the time described being physically and spiritually sated by Jesus' side wound, which is what communion is to Christians today. I too know the gift of a wound. After 10 years of quiet, confused suffering inside, distraught with gender dysphoria of self-hatred and loathing, invisible to all people but myself, I took action and began communion with my body. In the face of much transphobic alienation, I have persisted my medical transition for 10 years now. My body's changes and hormone replacement therapy are real-world miracles. Verifiable transmography. Ten years of countless dissolvable pills, nighttime tablets, skin patches, injections, blood draws, electric shocks, referrals and consultations, co-payments and copious delays after delays. I finally arrived in my garden of Gethsemane 
in May of 2023, but I arrived only with the fears of others to soothe, having myself faced the worst suffering within my body already. No superficial knife could threaten me. With the miracles of medicine merging with the science of surgery, I too finally received the life-giving wound as a gift. When I was first told I would need to electrically and chemically permanently remove body hair to prepare for surgery, I was intimidated. I feared being obliterated by the most grueling pain I had ever experienced, repeated over and over and concentrated again and again. When I was first told that my body would always consider my neo-vagina a wound I would need to physically maintain for the rest of my life, I was saddened. Saddened that my body could misunderstand what I had been pursuing for 20 years now. But now I understand how it feels having rolled an unmovable boulder, having received the most life from my own blood, that a wound can be a gift that hurting is part of healing. So today, I offer to rest with you in the comfort that your body and my transgender body too can be the body of all bodies. Bodies big enough to encompass all suffering and strong enough to endure beyond the acute temporality of suffering this suffering that is the conduit of change. The suffering of change has finally revealed to me why transgender people exist. As famous transgender author and theologian Julian K. Giraud professed, God blessed me by making me transsexual for the same reason he made wheat but not bread and fruit but not wine so that humanity may partake in the miracle of creation. My stone has been rolled away. I have been given a second lease on life. Transitioning has saved my life. Transitioning has allowed me to create myself, to give birth to myself anew. Blessed be, I surely am. We say in our values that we support the spiritual growth and well-being of our congregational community, cultivating gratitude, joy, curiosity, wonder, and an openness to personal and relational transformation as we strive to build a better world. We are all transforming in every moment. Each of us is unfolding and becoming more authentically ourselves as we practice loving and being loved. Being in beloved community means that no one is outside the circle of love and care. It means we are building the world we imagine is possible, where each person is able to live fully as they are, as they wish to be, as they hope to become. To honor the love and divinity in each of us that is emerging even in this moment, we will bless one another with glitter. This is environmentally friendly, biodegradable glitter in a gentle on the skin aloe vera gel. So be not afraid. Forrest Marie and I will come down the center aisle and bless the person on the end of each row, and you will each get a each row will get a little small jar filled with the skin friendly and earth friendly glitter gel and then you'll turn to the person next to you to offer them a blessing. You can indicate where you would like to receive the blessing on your forehead or your cheek or your hand, or if you prefer not to have a, any glitter gel on you, that's okay. You can just put your hands across your chest, but we'll still share the blessing with you. And we will say to one another, where would you like yours? Okay. From forehead to chest. You are loved for who you are now 
and who you are becoming. May our shared love empower your lifelong changes, and may your ever becoming relieve the world of its suffering. You are loved for who you are now and who you are becoming. May our shared love empower your lifelong, your lifelong changes. May your ever becoming relieve the world of its suffering. That's it, Dean. All right. We're going to start with the choir, and then we'll come down the center aisle and pass our baskets. And you'll, the words will be on the screen, and we also will hand you a little piece of paper.
keep working it around, make sure everybody gets a chance. And if if you end up with a, a glitter jar, I think we have one that lost its lid. We have an extra lid. But if you can um, afterwards bring them up uh, and put them in the little baskets. Where did the baskets go? I don't know. Kathy's got them and Susan's got them. All right, as we extinguish the chalice flame, please join in saying these words on the screen by the Reverend Elizabeth Sell Jones. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And please rise in body, or spirit and join in singing our closing hymn by Libby Roderick. I want to give you some specific instructions. This is um, a beautiful hymn that many of you know, and I want us to sing it as Reverend Kimberly Debus suggests. She has a beautiful ministry of music through our hymnals, and she encourages us to sing once through to remember how it goes, and then I invite you to turn to the person next to you and sing it to them in their eyes. And then the last time, we will sing it to ourselves. Come on, you can do it. It's OK to cry. It's OK to cry. against despair. You are light casting out shadows, shining from your unique self and reflecting the light you find in others. You are divinely human, mystery of eternity and dust. Be vulnerable, be strong, be your whole self as you walk forward to bless the world. Let us go together making peace and building the beloved community here on earth. Please take a flower too before you go and enjoy the potluck. Easter egg hunt, people meet at the nest. <laughs>